Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Paul Elam with A Voice for Men, and welcome to ABFM News and Activism. Tonight, a special edition. We are speaking with the one and only Robert Stacy McCain. He's an American conservative journalist, a writer, a blogger. He's also a former assistant national editor at the Washington Times and author of Sex Trouble, Radical Feminism and the War Against Human Nature. you got to love a title like that. He's also the proprietor of the blog, The Other McCain. Uh, Robert, welcome. Glad to have you here. Well, it's good to be here, Paul. Uh, listen, we're coming up on a really big, I think, political season when it comes to sexual politics, feminism, and all that stuff. We've got Hillary coming up on the left uh, uh, I think most people would assume, and I'm wondering, since you're really the expert between the two of us on American politics, uh, do you see Hillary as a shoe-in for the nomination? Uh, it, it, yeah, it's, I mean, it was set up in advance. You know, there was this, there was this brief moment um, in, uh, I guess it was September, August, September, where the talk was, is Joe Biden going to run? Just to, you know, sort of stimulate the interest in the race, because otherwise, it, it, you know, it's Hillary all the way. The Clinton machine is going on all cylinders, and they're aiming to prevent the kind of debacle they had in 2008, which I, I covered that all the way to the end. You may remember, do you remember the dead enders for, 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 uh, Hillary, you know, the, uh, or what did they call themselves? Um, oh my goodness. I've forgotten. They had a little slogan, uh, uh, oh. You mean you, you, <laughs> can't, you can't remember the every slogan from the left? They called themselves the Pumas. Party unity, my ass. <laughs> there were some some hardcore Hillary supporters that went all the way to the end and were very frustrated that uh, uh, Barack Obama uh, got the nomination. And so um, and so, but this time they it looks like they've got the machine, and so so we can prepare for the Hillary uh, 2016 coronation. Well, yeah, I'm not surprised to hear you say that. Listen, let me ask you a, a couple of questions here, and I want to get right into the, the nitty-gritty on American politics and the, the, the ever-present uh, left versus right struggle, how it's being handled, what's going to be coming up in the election. Uh, one of my observations, Robert, is that the, uh, the supposed conservative America has not done a very good job of addressing feminist corruption, feminist lies, and e even forms of feminist governance that are now controlling things like what happens to our young men in college. Uh, do you think I'm being too critical on conservatives to say that they have not responded to this effectively? Well, they're scared to death, Paul, is, is the problem is, it, and, and I noticed this in, tw in 2008, that that there was a that there was this uh, you may remember the um, proposition eight in California sure. and there was this this huge thing on uh, uh, gay marriage and this proposition had passed this referendum and I noticed that conservatives were 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 you know, pulling back they were afraid to be accused of hate. Uh, and, and so, and so, rather than than take the issue head on, there there was a lot of talk about the will of the people and the Constitution and stuff like that. And as I pointed out at the time, this idea of equality, see, is is so sacrosanct in our uh, political rhetoric. And you're seeing this with Hillary. This this idea that. That well, it's time we had a woman, and you can't criticize a woman in certain ways because if you do, well, you're a sexist. And so this this fear of being accused of sexism. You've seen how they they went after Donald Trump when Donald Trump said rude things about uh, various people. Donald Trump says rude things about everybody. You know? <laughs> sure. and it, He's but, good but, at but it too. Every, <laughs> You, what's that? He's good at it too. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it's like, okay, this is Donald Trump being Donald Trump. We expect this. And 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 there were so many people who wanted to say say, well, well, I I disapprove of that. And they were white knighting, as it were, um some of this and, and you know the language of white knighting uh that comes uh, a lot of it comes out of uh, what what they uh, call uh pickup artists p u a people who talk about the white knight who's who's trying to act like the good guy and trying to paint somebody else as the bad guy so this spills over from culture into politics and this idea that well, can't criticize a woman the way you would criticize a man, because if you do, then then you're some kind of sexist. And you see the feminist columnists and commentators uh, setting this up for 2016, that any criticism of Hillary uh, is going to be portrayed as sexist. And so, and so, yes, uh, you know, conservatives have, have failed to do their homework on this. And, and I wonder, again, and let's really dig into this, because I sometimes when I see conservatives, and if somebody that's, that, that leans right up center personally, I mean, I, in my activism, I, I try to remain uh, apolitical, but I mean, personally, I am right up center. I got to go with the full self-disclosure there. Um, what I've noticed is what appears to me to be that conservatives have bought into the idea that if you won, if you criticize feminists, it's the same thing as criticizing women. Right. And number two, that according to traditional values, men are supposed to shut up and not complain about this stuff anyway. Right, 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 right. It's, it, this, it, it, it is a double bind uh, because, you know, conservatives care a lot about decorum. Okay, uh, and, the, and by the way, I want to point out that I'm an ex-Democrat, okay? And and when I was a Democrat, Democrats don't give a damn about fairness in political discourse, okay? They will accuse you of all kinds of things. You, I remember during the Reagan years, you know, this all this thing that, you know, Reagan was Hitler, you know, and Republicans are always Hitler. Uh, Newt Gingrich was Hitler, and Donald Trump is Hitler, and everything is fascist and, and corporate greed, and they, and they, and and you know, and when I was a Democrat, I didn't even think twice about it. Democrats don't care about. Democrats care about winning. Okay, they you know, at bottom line, the Democrat Party is a party that's all about power. You can't have power if you don't win, and they don't care how they win. And 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 the thing is, is that, and we see it all the time, is that Democrats get away with things that any Republican, it would be a huge scandal, you sure. know. And, and and we saw this, you know, the classic example of this was. Uh, the Lewinsky scandal, where you actually had a feminist, and, and, and I, I can't call the woman's name right now, who said that she would don her presidential knee pads and give Bill Clinton a blowjob uh, just for keeping abortion legal. I remember <laughs> that. I don't remember who it was either, but I remember, I remember that coming out. Well, well, you know, we've seen this recently. You know, in 2011, Anthony Weiner was exposed as, you know, for, for, quite literally exposed, <laughs> uh, you know, in a, in a sexting scandal. And, and it was thought, well, that's the last we'll see for him. Well, you know, two years later, he's, he's the leading candidate. He was the leading Democrat candidate for mayor of New York. And then suddenly another sex scandal comes in. Well, you know, this is highly relevant to uh, 2016 because, of course, Anthony Weiner is married to Huma Abedin, who is, you know, um, Hillary Clinton's uh, right-hand woman, so to speak. So that this hits very close to the, you know, the Clinton scandal. Uh, the Clinton campaign, and yet no one's talking about Anthony Weiner, a.k.a. Carlos Danger, you see. Right. 
And and and, and this circle of, of you know uh, you know Bill Clinton and his flights to uh, you know uh, pedophile island as they call it with his you know billionaire friend who's now. Uh, I believe, uh, wasn't he convicted or did he plead guilty to some sort of uh, charge uh, in relation to this where they had actual teenage sex slaves more or less on this Caribbean island uh, that Bill Clinton visited? And and are you, are you seeing this in the news? No, 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 that's not a real scandal, you see, because it's Democrats. Well, uh, there's no doubt uh, that that's the case. I, I recall some details. I believe the guy pleaded no contest, but don't don't pin me to that uh, because I only say that with with mostly being certain about it. Um, let me ask you this. I mean, and, and it's apparent. And see, the 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 audience that's going to listen to this program, Mr. McCain, is one that is very, very familiar with feminist doctrine, feminist history, the, uh, the all the things you're talking about, the lopsidedness in the media that's pro-feminist and, and in politics, in our universities. Um, and they're struggling. There is a, a an ideological struggle there politically uh, between a lot of, of people in this community about where the answers lie. Because on one hand, we see that um, obviously... Feminism's breeding ground is on the left. There's just no doubt about it. That's where it comes from. That's where all the insane policies come from. Stuff like the Dear Colleague letter, where we basically eviscerated civil rights for young men entering a college campus and thrown them to the wolves at any, you know, for any crooked finger that's pointed at them. But they're also struggling because they see on the other side of the fence that, you know, what's happening? Why isn't conservative America more savvy to this stuff? Why aren't they getting down into it? And you're a guy that obviously gets it. I mean, I see that uh, we're, I'm, I'm looking at your blog right now at an article that you just published on the 8th, Questioning Feminist Authority, Cult Ideology, and Mind Control Tactics. Uh, there will be a link to this in the low bar, folks, uh, and I highly suggest reading it. It's a great article that really cuts to the quick about the insanity that we're dealing with. And I know that the people listening to this want me to ask you, how is it that you can get this stuff so well and that so many other conservatives are just clueless about what's going well, on? One of the one of the problems, Paul, is that it has been the tendency of conservatives generally uh, to laugh at feminists, to to make fun of them. Uh, and to, you know, to uh, occasionally uh, some feminist will do something or say something, something will happen on a college campus usually or, 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 or something like that. And, and someone like Rush Limbaugh or Bill O'Reilly will come out and say, ah, ha, ha, look at the silly feminists. Because they're afraid that if you, it, if you take it seriously, and, and, and this is what I've been doing for the past couple of years, if you begin to take feminism seriously, then uh, they feel like they're giving it more dignity than it deserves. So that's one problem. Uh, there, are a, there are a comparative handful of people uh, including Ash Shaw with the Washington Examiner right. and Christina Hoff Summers with the American Enterprise Institute, who do regularly, you know, who have gone in full time more or less to this. And there is this tendency, and I, it, it, this is, I've noticed this uh, for a long time. There's this tendency among conservatives to say, "Well, we've got people dealing with this, you see, and we we have." Uh, our resident expert over here who can talk about feminism and that will take care of it. And so they don't feel the need to get full time. And, and as you and I know, as, and now I'm sure most of your listeners know, um, we are tremendously outgunned in terms of manpower and resources in comparison to the feminists who have you know major five hundred one c three foundations? They have the universities, especially, and they have so many friends in the media 
that their message is, and you know, and the public schools now, the K through 12 public schools, have have begun uh, uh, instilling uh, feminism in the in, in the grade school curriculum now, right. and so that, that you know, the, uh, another example, the American Library Association is is heavily, of course, because librarians are, guess what, overwhelmingly female. That there is this, there is this huge uh, disadvantage in terms of of, of getting uh, what you would call our message or or the uh, uh, critical message about feminism. Uh, the criticism about feminism is is very hard to find. You, you, you and it always appears that there's just one or two people, and and okay, if there's one or two or three people out there talking about it then it seems as if, well, you can dismiss those people. They don't speak for anybody, and they don't have anything serious to say. And, and, and this creates uh, uh, enormous problems. And, and as I say, you, you have to ask, why aren't uh, the major conservative donors, okay, the Koch brothers and um, and people like that, why aren't they giving to to help create a stronger and more robust criticism of feminism. And and and, and, and until they do, and last and until they do, the situation we're in right now will continue. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that that may be, and that's the sort of the next area I wanted to get into, because we have sort of officially entered election season all the way through to next year's November elections. Uh, I anticipate, and I'm, I'm sure that most people do, that we're going to see with Hillary as the presumptive nominee, uh, coming back out with war against women rhetoric, uh, designed to put the right back on their heels and uh, to make them shut up and to make them accept BS like rape culture, like um, the wage gap, like so many of these things that have already been debunked a thousand times over. Um, Absolutely. The, so the question is, is the right in this election going to be forced to respond to the war on women rhetoric rather than just, you know, surrender to it? Well, I, I mean, one way or the other, you're, you're, you're calling it exactly right. And, and when I uh, uh, began work on the project that became the book Sex Trouble, um, one of the things that I had in mind, you know, I covered the uh, 2012 campaign beginning with the Republican primaries and, you know, on, on the campaign trail in early 2011. And I covered it all the way through to the bitter end in Ohio. And I, my final column on the thing was was in, at the American Spectator, was entitled "Doom Beyond All Hope of Redemption." Okay, I was in a very dark mood. And one of the things that people don't realize about that campaign is that the war on women rhetoric was decisive. Okay, that's what decided that campaign because the, as Gallup, in the history of the Gallup poll, it was the largest gender gap ever recorded in the vote. The, the, the Democrat advantage among women uh, was the largest ever recorded by Gallup. Now, when you think about that, and you, you, you know, everyone, when you, you know, when you're talking about Barack Obama, the first black president, well, well, you think in terms of race, but the gender gap uh, proved to be the key to defeating Mitt Romney, and and the Romney campaign had no clue. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got to say that I don't think binders full of women helped him very much. Well, you know, and see, and this is one of the things is that very, uh, very minor remarks uh, that 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 a Republican makes uh, in in a situation like that, very minor, just phrases that he uses, 
it will be jumped on and trumpeted and amplified in the media. Uh, because the media is, it, it, you can do studies and find that the, the Democrat to Republican ratio in the media is about eight to one. Right. And, and so because of this partisan bias of the media, any little mistake or gaffe or, or, or somebody says something the wrong way is going to get blown up to huge proportions uh, in the media. And so he paid the price for that. Well, Seeing that the gender gap had been so decisive in 2012, when I my readers at my blog, you know, sort of incited me to do more stuff on feminism, and finally they they kept you know enough commenters at the blog said you ought to write a book, you ought to write a book, and I said all right, I'll write a book. And uh, oh, can you give us and, the, uh, the the full title of that book, by the way, because I'm going to want to put that in the low bar, a link to it in, for those that want to go in and purchase okay. and read it. It is Sex Trouble, Radical Feminism, and the War Against Human Nature. In the first edition, I, 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 I self-published in February, and I'm preparing uh, the revised and extended second edition. And this is, you know, that I've continued the series on the uh, blog, and if you'll go down to the uh, bottom of that column you cited, you will see the Sex Trouble tag there at the bottom under categories. Well, if you click on that tag, you can go back and scroll through the entire series, which is over a hundred columns by now. But the, uh, but what, you know, when I began seriously studying feminist theory, because this is when you, when you, the difference between liberal feminism and radical feminism is that radical feminism has a theory. Okay, liberal feminism, and by this, say, for example, um, Amanda Marcotte. Amanda Marcotte is a liberal feminist. She is basically, and, and the same is basically true of Jessica Valenti, that they are both just basically uh, the Democrat Party in skirts, okay? They're, right. You know, they're... They're basically partisan Democrats, and they just use the rhetoric of feminism to justify their partisanship. When you start dealing with radical feminists, you're talking about Catherine McKinnon, Andrea Dworkin, uh, Sheila Jeffries. Uh, some of these names will be familiar to your readers. Mary Daly. Uh, and, and this is a, a much more... Uh, there is a theory uh, that, that could really, you could trace it back to 1969 in, in, in the radical collective known as Red Stockings, uh, which was led by Shua Myth Firestone. And that was really uh, this cauldron of radicalism is where it comes from. And there is a, there is a, a very clear theory behind radical feminism. Uh, which is what is being taught in uh, universities uh, under the women's studies programs that I, I refer to as the feminist industrial complex. Uh, and it is within these uh, women's studies programs that so many of the issues that we're talking about today, and you're talking about rape culture, it was it was in these little campus Covens is the best way to describe them. It's in these campus covens of academic feminism that an, uh, an idea like rape culture comes up and then it bleeds out from academia into popular culture and into politics. Well, anyways, I started going into this theory and, and then uh, just about the time I started doing this in, in mid uh, 2014, suddenly the rape epidemic, the campus rape epidemic, one in five, one in five, uh, it began bubbling up, and I said, aha, I was correct. They are planning to go back to this war on women meme, and it was clear to me, if it's clear to no one else, that this rape culture business and this idea that the campuses of America's colleges and universities are 
you know, a, a, a cauldron of sexual assault. Uh, well, well, this is, you know, this is battle space preparation for 2015. This is about uh, exciting young uh, feminists uh, in, to, to support Hillary. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's so phony, and as I'm sure you've pointed out over and over and over again, the, um, the statistics, the actual statistics don't bear up uh, this claim of an epidemic. And it, it's basically a propaganda war, and a big part of it is to elect Hillary Clinton. And of course, if you if you come out and say publicly that those numbers don't bear up and that it's a propaganda war, then then you're a rape apologist or a yes. rape supporter. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you've got to hand they, it they to them. It's a, it's a good it was strategy. Amanda Marcotte, it was Amanda Marcotte who coined the phrase rape truthers. So, yes. <laughs> We're yes. rape truthers. Yes, you become a truther when you cite research these days, uh, I'm afraid. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Robert. Uh, now, we do have the coming election, and we also know that in recent times, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that there is actually a grassroots uh, movement, uh, several movements afoot that are non-feminist or anti-feminist, that there is a, an increasing popularity for dissent from feminism. Uh, people are starting to th see through the BS. Uh, we have the, the, the group Women Against Feminism, which uh, caught international headlines uh, for a while there. The, you see in places like Breitbart a lot more anti-feminist uh, writing, uh, the stuff that you're doing. This is becoming more popular. Are elements on the right going to catch on to this and exploit it, do you think, in this coming election? Elements on the right. <laughs> this is, in other words, are you asking whether the Republican National Committee yes, sir, or that's Republicans, what I mean. or Republican leadership in the Senate, are they going to wake up? Uh, are the are there going to be committee hearings? And this is what I've been waiting for, by the way. I want to see that committee where. <sighs> Oh, what was that girl, excuse me for saying girl, that girl from the University of Virginia who testified about the, what proved to be the hoax of the gang rape at a UVA fraternity. You remember this? Oh, yes. Okay. And she was brought in to testify in the summer of 2014, and it was from her that Sabrina Rubin Erdeli of uh, uh, Rolling Stone got onto that story that, that ultimately turned into one of the biggest journalistic hoaxes of, of, the, of this century. And, and where is the Senate hearing to call back in these same witnesses and to call in the officials at UVA and to ask, how did this happen? Okay, what is the real fact, you know, that's involved here? Well, we haven't seen, sim uh, you know, uh, similarly, you know, you don't hear, uh, you don't hear uh, someone, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Reince Priebus talking about some of the issues we're talking about. Uh, and, and you can talk about these, by the way, as you said, you know, the distinction between criticizing feminism and criticizing women has to be clearly established because you, you know, if this is one thing is that when people read my blog, you know, the, you know, sometimes the question is, well, well, you know, gee, you know, you must have some personal issue with women. And I say, you don't have any issue with women. It's feminism. It's about ideology. It's like telling me that because I oppose Hitlerism, right, that you're anti-German. You have some bias against Germany if you criticize Hitler. Well, you can criticize feminism without being anti-women, just the same way is that you can criticize the NAACP without being racist. Okay, you can criticize um, 
uh, ISIS without being anti-Muslim. Okay? And, and, and we're, these confusions that if you criticize a certain movement or a certain ideology, that you're criticizing some group of people for whom these ideologues claim to speak, you've got to take that on directly. Uh, and and a lot of conservatives aren't willing to do the kind of heavy lifting and battle space preparation that's necessary to make these arguments. You have to make people think. Why is it that, that this one in five number is sacred? That if you question it, oh, you're pro rape. I, I've got two daughters, okay? You know, I've got a wife. I, I, I don't want anyone to be raped at college. But when you start looking at the actual numbers, and I, I actually wrote a piece called The Campus Rape Shortage. Uh, that, <laughs> that, that they have, they have created these sexual uh, officers at some of these universities, and this one was one of the campuses of the State University of New York that I was talking about here, they have taken this sociology uh, researcher and put her in, installed her, I think she may have been a women's studies professor, and they've installed her as the sexual assault prevention officer. Well, <laughs> when... when when the actual statistics came out about the number of actual reports, it wasn't anywhere near one in five. It wasn't one in 50. It wasn't even one in 150. Okay, it was such a small number that how can you justify a full-time position to deal with a, a handful of cases in, in the course of a year on a campus of over... 15,000 students. You know, in other words, just let the police handle it, and, and that's okay. But no, uh, they, they have to, it's a, it's a, it looks like an employment racket. Well, where are the state legislators in uh, New York or Virginia or North Carolina? Where are the state legislators calling hearings to investigate this? You know, because this is one of the duties of the state legislature is to ensure that the people's money, the tax dollars, are being spent wisely. And this includes university education, okay, state universities. Well, you know, in South Carolina a couple of years ago, they actually eliminated the women's studies department at, at uh, one of the campuses after there was a huge controversy because the woman who was leading the program uh, held an event where had a one-woman play called How to Be a Lesbian in 10 Days or Less. Okay? Oh, <laughs> and this my. is South Carolina. The state legislature just zeroed out the budget for this. They said, we don't need this, you know. And, and, and you know, the feminists kind of got their nose out of joint, but they didn't want to make too much of an issue out of it because then people start going, Wait a minute, is this what the women's studies agenda is all about? You know, so they don't want to attract too much attention to that case because uh, it might make people start asking questions. And feminists don't like it when you start asking questions. No, they don't. As a matter of fact, um, last year we pulled the reports from the three largest universities in Pennsylvania and the statistic of reported sexual assaults or attempted sexual assaults on those three campuses came up with the number one in 1984. Right. One in 2,000. Yes. It's sort of like we're approaching, you know, lightning strike statistics here. And also, I mean, it's no secret out there that campus rape officers are the Maytag repairmen uh, of university employment. They literally have nothing to do. And yes. yet we have a narrative going on that a young woman on campus can't make it from one class to another without being raped a couple of times. Right, right, right. Well, you know, um, one of the books uh, that, that if, you, if you start studying the history of this and, and where this rape culture uh, narrative came from, 
you inevitably get to Peggy Reeves Sanday's book. I believe it was 1985. I could tell you what the date is, but it, it is Fraternity Gang Rape is the title of the book. And it has to do with an incident that happened at, at um, Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League school, um, at a fraternity in 1983, which just coincidentally was the year I graduated college down at Jacksonville State University in Alabama. Uh, but anyways, at Penn, this Ivy League school, this girl did four hits of LSD, uh, acid, uh, and she was, uh, this woman apparently was having, she was a student, and, and while tripping on acid, she went to this uh, fraternity house where she had some friends, and there was a party going on, and she proceeded, of course, to get uh, grievously drunk, and at at some point, about 3 a.m., she was shouting, uh, according to witnesses, she was basically shouting, uh, have intercourse with me, except a, a, a four-letter Anglo-Saxon uh, verb was used uh, to get, and she, was, and she was with these guys, and so, so four or five of them obliged her. Well... Somehow, a couple of days later, she said something to a professor uh, or someone, and, and this story comes up, and it's and it's and these young men who, by the way, never were 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 charged with any crime, or or not. I believe the students weren't even disciplined. The fraternity was shut down. Okay, uh, it was uh, basically their charter was revoked, and and. Um, there was this huge story. Uh, it, it, it made the New York Times and other places. But the question uh, was, was this funny? Well, I think that no one would want uh, their daughter to have sex with five fraternity guys. And, but no one would want their daughter to do four hits of acid and then go to a frat party. Okay? Probably not. And, Right, but when you say that, and, and you see how the rhetoric has, has shifted, when you say that, well, you're victim blaming or you're slut shaming or you're a rape apologist, and I'm like, no, that's not what it's about, you know. But but this, it's misogyny, you know, to expect women to exercise even the most minimal level of responsible judgment about their behavior. Uh, if she says she was raped, she was raped, and it doesn't matter what the facts are. And this is, it's a frightening thing. Uh, when you start going through, and there's over a hundred of them, there are now a, a hundred, uh, was it 106 at last count, uh, Title IX lawsuits against universities by uh, young men who say that they were basically denied due process uh, in these uh, campus hearings and these procedures that seem designed, uh, you know, to just to expel them the moment they're accused, and and when you start reading the uh, uh, the the complaints and filings in these cases, you're going, this is crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely insane. The, did you read the case of the John Doe versus Brown University? Yes. It was filed. It just was it last month or, the, or in October. Uh, the uh, John Doe versus Brown University. Okay, at a party in October 2014, guy meets girl at a party. They begin kissing at the party. They decide to go back to his room, and it, it, according to the complaint, he actively saw the consent. Is it okay if we do this? And they're lying on his bed, and, and you know, he never even got to third base, okay? Uh, yes, we would say. You know, that they're making out, and, and she says, okay, well, stop, and he stops, and then she leaves. And then, according to him, the following evening, he was at another party, and she was there, and he didn't speak to her at that party, 
And according to his interpretation of events, she got mad at him because he didn't follow up after their make-out session of the night before. And this was what gave rise to uh, the, the sexual assault allegation. And, and I remember when Ace of Spades uh, blogged about it, it was like, this is, this is insane. You know, you, you make out with a girl after a party and you're expelled for sexual assault. It, you know, a lot of people don't. Uh, a lot of people don't know, Robert, that this stuff has been documented. Uh, in Eugene Kanan's study uh, of the the four major areas that pre precede false allegations, revenge of this sort is one of them. Yeah. Well, see, you you hesitate, and and this is one of the things when I'm talking about specific cases like this, I want to emphasize, and it, it, it's like the Paul Nungesser uh, uh, versus Emma Solkowitz case at Columbia University, the famous mattress girl case, is that, is that I hesitate to say that I know that someone is innocent, okay? You, you know, you, right. you, have to, you have to be careful to say that, well, I know she's lying, and and that this is a false accusation, because it, 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 over and over and over again, as we see in these, it's, it's a he said, she said situation. Well, but he certainly is, deserves the presumption of innocence. Right, right. And, a, it, and, and this is one of the reasons these things are, are happening in the, in the context of campus disciplinary hearings, because in a court of law, no, 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 in the Nungesser case, uh, the prosecutor, you know, this case was actually went to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor says, there's no way I can prosecute this. It's just, you know, in a court of law, you simply cannot convict someone of sexual assault in a situation where the evidence, as we have seen of text messages and stuff like that, it simply doesn't point toward uh Guilt. You just you just cannot uh, look at it this way. And, and uh, none guessers' uh, explanation of it again in this case is is uh, hell hath no fury uh, like a woman scorned, as you know. And and this is uh, basically uh, the case of uh, two hookup buddies. Uh, you know, who had kind of a falling out because she was more interested in him than he was in her. In his mind, they were just casually having sex, but apparently she had real feelings toward him, and when she felt like she was being disrespected, this is how it got turned into this huge national headline case of, of so-called sexual assault. And I think that once people saw... The um, complaint in the Nungesser versus Columbia University case, once you read that complaint, you're like, oh, no, 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 this doesn't look like rape to me. And, and again, you can't say for sure that, you know, he's completely innocent. And maybe even considering what was admitted, you'd say, well, I wouldn't want my daughter to go out with a, a guy like Paul Nungesser. But at the same time, you know, we're talking about a serious criminal accusation and when you're talking about sexual assault. And you just cannot convict someone in the court of public opinion uh, where the evidence is just not there. Well, and unfortunately, this is the, uh, the problem with the star chambers that have been developed out of the Obama administration's uh, Dear Colleague letter is that while they're not criminal convictions, when they are putting these young men before, you know, they're called honor courts, where they have people who are not trained in gathering criminal evidence, when there is no real due process, there's no opportunity to face your accuser or to question them. Uh, in many cases, there's not even an opportunity to have a, a lawyer present uh, during the hearing. They are effectively railroaded and convicted, at least on the scholastic level. Their academic careers are ruined. And this has been going on uh, right now. There's well over 100 lawsuits pending against universities right now for that very thing. Yeah, well, you know, there was a recent, one of the recent cases that was filed 
it, it was uh, Georgia Tech, uh, John Doe versus Georgia Tech. You look that case up, and again, it's it's a case where it, it, there's clear ambiguity and 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 certainly a reasonable doubt. I mean, this you could never convict someone of rape under the circumstance in a criminal court. Uh, under the circumstances which this student, a senior with a 3.74 average in engineering at Georgia Tech, a senior with a 3.74 average is being expelled because his date got sick at a frat party. Okay, she, according to the complaint, she got sick. They were going to his room, and she got sick and vomited. And and he and a friend helped her leave. And there was no allegation at the time of, of sexual assault until he was a year later. I think actually was it eight months, but it was it, it was so far gone, you know, that you couldn't possibly say. Well, if she was raped, I mean, the common sense thing is, if this was rape, where was the the previous, you know, evidence that she was traumatized and things like that? Well, you know, again, uh, you know, look at the uh, regret equals rape case at uh, uh, Washington and Lee University in Virginia. That's this one of the most grievous cases I've seen. Uh, where where the Title IX compliance officer gave a lecture on campus where she said that, well, if you regret having sex with someone, uh, this this is rape. And, and this is part of the complaint in this, uh, this lawsuit. And it's just insane. It's absolutely insane. And, you know, people say, well, well, why do you care so much? You're not going to college or stuff like that. Hey, I, I'm saying that we are inculcating people's minds wrong ideas. Okay, it doesn't matter how many, you know, and, and, and by the way, you know, every time you bring this up, the, the, the feminists will say, well, uh, it's been shown that false accusations are only 4% or 8% of, of, of all sexual assault cases. And, well, that's all fine and good unless you're in the 8%. You see? I mean, that's, that's like a 1 in 12 shot of being falsely accused. Okay? And when you have these militants on campus, you know, having their... Uh, slut walk parades and their take back the night vigils and, and you have posters on many campuses now you have posters everywhere you know talking about the importance of consent and stuff like this and it's it rape culture is not about rape it's about culture they're trying to change the culture of of human behavior Okay, it's I mean, you know, it's just normal human behavior and they're in their you know, they're effect, they have effectively criminalized heterosexuality on college campuses. I, I I said this several times, especially on Twitter, is that, is that if I had a son in college right now, I'm telling him under no circumstance should you even speak to a girl on campus. You should avoid women at college. You can't accuse me of being a rape apologist. If I had my way, no man attending, smart enough to go to college would be stupid enough to talk to a college girl. Because under these circumstances, you, you know, so you could, you know, the harassment, you know, the, the accusation of harassment is, is, is damaging enough. But if you should, if a girl should start smiling with you, you know, Paul Nungesser never saw this coming. John, the various John Doe's out there had no clue, right? You know, you take a girl to a party, you're making out with her, you know, it's kind of like she's like, okay, well, that's enough. And you you go on about your way, and a week later, a month later, a year later, suddenly you're hauled into the dean's office and told you've been accused of sexual assault. 
You know, and this is insane, Paul. It's just craziness. And it's happening at, at, in some of the worst cases or at some of the most elite universities. These students pay $45,000 or $50,000 a year to attend these schools. And you're telling me that the only reason they go to college is to rape girls? <laughs> Does this even make sense? You know, these are the, some of the smartest young men in America, you know, you, you don't get into Yale or Harvard uh, because you, you know, kind of got a B average in high school, okay? These are, these are, you know, brainiacs, the smartest kids in America. And you're telling me that they don't understand the word no? It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And speaking of Harvard, if I can quickly transition, few of us realize Serious, the issue of feminism had to come in 2005, and, the, and this is the, the case I mentioned in my book. Lawrence Summers, who had been Treasury Secretary um, under an economic advisor to President Clinton, became president of Harvard University, and at a conference about women in science, he began discussing some of the factors that might explain the comparative shortage of uh, top uh, researchers and professors and other academics in the field of the hard sciences, engineering, physics, and so forth. And, and in the course of explaining it, he used the phrase innate differences to suggest that perhaps uh, there are some studies that show that, that there are or basic brain differences between men and women that could account for the relative shortage of these, you know, PhD level researchers in the sciences. And he only put this out there as one of three or four possible explanations for the differences. But this phrase of innate differences turned into such a huge scandal. It was written up in the New York Times of Globe, everywhere else. He was drummed off campus. Within a year, he was forced to resign as president of Harvard University simply for suggesting that there are innate differences between men and women. It's insane, and it's happened at our nation's most elite universities. Well, and uh, the, I mean, he was a great example of this, and I think a great example, too, uh, because I agree with you, this is literally insane, what's going on, and what is even more disturbing to me is that there is no, no strong voice in the culture that is up against this saying, wait a minute, there are innate differences between men and women. We have volumes of science that proves it. He said yes. what was true. Right, and, and, and one of the things is, and, and you know, the economist Tom Sowell uh, uh, is so good on these things in, in talking. If you've ever read his book, um, The uh, Vision of the Anointed, okay, and, and this is one book, but, but I remember an essay that he wrote in the New Republic re responding to uh, the book, The Bell Curve. You remember 20 years ago, there was a huge controversy about this book, The Bell Curve, which was about intelligence. Right. And, and, and one of the, what made it so controversial was the suggestion that, that the average group differences, okay, between blacks, whites, Asians, and so forth, that, that, may be, there may be a substantial genetic factor in the differences, average group differences uh, between members of different ethnic groups. And this was condemned as eugenics and Hitlerism and this, that, and the other. And Thomas Sowell wrote this wonderful um, response to it, which said that, well, the question about nature and nurture has to address the also the issue of culture, okay? That that you know Thomas Sowell, one of the most, who is by the way black and one of the most uh, uh, popular uh, 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 economists in the whole world and, and very influential, 
Uh, Thomas Sowell made the case that you have to think about culture. You can't just look at it as genetics or environment. You have to ask about the contribution of culture, what we inherit um, in terms of the influences around us in our community and, and expectations like this. And the same is true when talking about male and female differences. We, it is, it's, it, it, this is so clear, uh, and this was so clear in, in they tried to make it clear in uh, the bell curve, is that we are not saying, when, when you talk about average group differences, you're not saying that, well, all people in this group are stupid and all people in this group are geniuses. It's not... You know, white supremacy, it's not male supremacy. You're talking about average group differences. And this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean anything for any particular individual. Talk about Gamergate. Let's just use this for an example. You, you know what Gamergate is, it's, and I'm sure all your listeners understand that Gamergate developed. Many of them uh, are involved in it. Right, right. Gamergate developed. It was controversy surrounding the video game industry and the question of whether whether certain uh, people in the industry were using uh, corrupt methods to get positive reviews for their products in the, uh, the, the game press, game signs like Kotaku, I think, is one of them, but, but there were these blogs and in in, 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 in online magazines about video games that weren't really talking about video games. They began talking about culture, and they began talking about objectification and the male gaze and this, that, and the other. And there was this, there's this awful woman named Anita Sarkeesian who, who began bringing feminist critical theory and feminist media theory into into discussing video games. And, and suddenly you had everybody uh, looking at video games and, and saying, look, only 14% of the, uh, the programmers in the video game industry are female. It's discrimination. No, it's culture, okay? Everybody knows, anybody that's got teenagers knows, uh, that, that your teenage son, if, if, if you've got sons and daughters, you know that it's your sons who are you know, spending all day on, on uh, uh, Call of Duty, you know, which is my, my son's just, you know, just slaughtering the world of Call of Duty. <laughs> there is something about this video game thing that appeals more to the male mind than it does to the female mind. Well, this doesn't mean that there are no... Uh, good uh, uh, female uh, gamers, and, it, and and when you start talking about computer programming, you, you know, software, Silicon Valley, you know, and, and the world of programming and high tech. Yes, yes, yes. You find more men than women as CEOs, programmers, everything else, and the reason for that is culture. This is, you know, this is. It's not just nature and nurture. It has something to do with culture, and there is this thing with guys doing tech. And, and it, if anyone who has actually raised boys and girls, and I've raised you know, uh, two daughters and four sons, so I, I've seen the difference directly if I you know, had firsthand experience, there is just a basic difference on average between and girls and what they're interested in and and how they think and how they behave. And it's, it's, this doesn't mean that there are no good female programmers or that there are anything else. It just means that on average, okay, that boys like certain things more than girls do and girls like certain things more than boys do. It's, it's just and of basic. course, that's a horribly misogynistic idea, Mr. McCain. Uh, you can't <laughs> possibly be asserting that boys and girls are any different because it's all a social construct. 
Right, and and then you go on Tumblr, right? <laughs> okay, you go on Tumblr and you say, "Where are the guys on Tumblr? Where are you? Where, where where's the male equivalent of feminist Tumblr? You know, I I I I, I, I mine feminist Tumblr for craziness. You know, and <laughs> people keep saying that. You know, I guess you'll never find another one crazier than this one, than whatever last one I drug up. And I said, oh, you wait, <laughs> you know, because because there there's these little hives in there of, of these things. But but you notice that, that even the use of, of different software sites like Instagram or things like what women do with these software programs is different than what men do with them. It's in, and you can say, well, this is some product of the patriarchy or stuff like that. It's no, it's human nature and it's culture, okay? If you could, okay, change the school curriculum and, and change the TV program so that you were producing uh, uh, men and women uh, equally interested, you know what would happen? If, I mean, if you if you could create this sort of androgynous equality between men and women that the feminists think is, 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 is possible, well, what would happen is that the birth rate would fall so drastically that your population would be, you know, uh, slowly destroyed by demographic decline over time, and you would be overrun eventually, because, you know, a rich society with a declining population is going to be overrun by a poor society with a high birth rate. And we're seeing this, and, and, you know, this is a segue to uh, radical Islam, you see, because, you know, if you start looking at the developed industrialized world, uh, you start looking at the birth rate in um, Japan. Uh, France, uh, Iceland, Norway, wherever. And you start looking at what the birth rates are in these countries, especially among the college-educated population. Well, yes, 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 we have more equality. And because we have equality, we have fewer marriages, we have uh, more divorces, we have fewer children, okay? So that the more equality you have you know, in this sense, the more you push equality at people, the fewer people you have. We're, we're committing cultural suicide, really, uh, in West, because of this, at, this fanatic attitude about, oh, we must have equality between men and women. Well, on college campuses, as, you, as I'm sure all your listeners know, 57% of U.S. college students are female. Men are, uh, 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 by, uh, you know, by a 14-point gap, uh, well, less that's, likely that's the, to attend college. <laughs> that's the liberal version of diversity. Right, right, right. right. And, and, the, and, and, and see, you have these claims of a rape epidemic on campuses where men are, are you know, outnumbered by women. And, and you have to ask yourself, wait a minute, okay? You're telling me that there's, uh, you know, uh, 14% more uh, women on campus than men, and yet men are in such dire straits. They're so they're so sexually aggressive that they're raping girls. I think that might be a little suspicious. That doesn't fit what I know about human nature. And it's a common sense question. If, if, if where men are fairly rare, can it really be that one in five female students is, is a victim of sexual assault? The, the most highly educated segment of our population it contains such a huge number of rapists? Well, it doesn't make sense, but you see that feminism is a totalitarian movement to destroy civilization as we know it. And there is no limit to feminism's demands. Okay, you give them equality, right? 57% of college students are women. Uh, they have achieved more 
than equality on the university campuses, it's not enough. It's oh, like, no, absolutely not. We've been asking feminists for for four decades now, are you equal or are you special? And they have answered yes. Uh, uh, well, well, listen, exactly. let, me, uh, let me interrupt for a moment. Our time is winding down. As a matter of fact, we're running over and I want to be sure I've got a, another question for you. I want to get in before we have to uh, end this thing. Um, Next uh, next year is coming. We're going to see stuff happening in the election. I I think that in terms of the dialogue that is has yet to be heard out there by the larger uh, population, which is the dialogue that we're having tonight, um, we'd like to see that happen. Personally, I would like to see not just as an edict from the RNC or from uh, candidates, but also across the board, conservatives across the country being willing to stand up and say, hey, you know what? If your daughter takes four hits of acid and goes to a party and yells, F me, F me, F me, and a couple of guys do, she's not a victim. So you can't be victim blaming. Um, I'd like to see that kind of dialogue come out. How do we make that happen? Well, I think it's important. It's important that everyone who, who can... Uh, you know, in other words, if everybody will do what you can, okay, from wherever you are, uh, uh, you know, at, at whatever level, uh, back during the, do you remember the Tea Party movement when that got started? You know, I explained that I had often over the course of years had, had gone to speak at civic groups and at Republican Party events and and conservative events, and I would talk about some problem or, or some issue, and people would say to me, but what can I do, right? And, and this is the, the question, what can I do? And I say, stop asking what you can do and start doing what you can. Don't sit around. For waiting from orders from headquarters. You look at what you do in your own life, within your own sphere of influence. If it's talking to the school board, if it's just talking to your children, you know, it's so important to warn children about these ideologies that are out there. Uh, you know, I, I had a phone conversation just a few days ago with a father whose daughter, teenage daughter, had gone online and gotten sucked into this cult, and it's really a cult, uh, even feminists have begun calling it a cult, this cult of transgender. And she you know, turned 18 and decided that she wanted to be male and has begun injecting herself with testosterone and talking about transition. And... And and they had no warning, okay? They had no clue. I mean, she has she been a little bit of a tomboy, but they had no idea that there was this vast web of these sites out here that are doing this, right? And you have got to talk to your – people have to talk to their own children, their own family members, the people in your church, your community. And you don't have to come up ranting like a fanatic, okay? But just point out to them, you know, if you get some article in, in a, you know, a, a Ash Shaw article or a Christine Hoff Summers article, you find an article somewhere that points out some of these problems, well, just see rocks off a few copies and hand them to friends, you know, say, here, look at this, this is interesting, you know. And you can spread the movement organically. The resistance to this ideology, this radical ideology, can be spread at a grassroots level if people will stop asking what they can do and start doing what they can. I can't think of a better note to wrap things up on. Folks, I've been talking with Robert Stacy McCain. Uh, you can find him at the other McCain. Uh, you can also, if you look in the low bar to this uh, presentation on YouTube, uh, 
uh, you will see a link where you can find his book, Sex Trouble, Radical Feminism and the War Against Human Nature. Very apropos title. Um, and with that, I want to thank you, Mr. McCain, for coming on. I hope we can do this again sometime. I'd like to have you back as the elections near, especially uh, for some analysis of what's happening. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Paul. And and please keep up the good work. Uh, we'll be following you in the days ahead. Uh, with right. that, I uh, ask everybody, remember, if you want to support the work we do at A Voice for Men, you can visit. Uh, there's a link in the low bar. Visit the Patreon page. Uh, help us out with something in the tip jar to keep uh, help us keep bringing you these great interviews and doing all the other work that we do. Uh, with that, I wish everybody a good night, and we'll see you next time.